Okay, we're live, but we're letting it breathe just for a second here. We've got to let it breathe, baby. Bring on Facebook. Get things started proper. And we are good. Welcome in, everybody. It is the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, and with me is my fellow football priest. You know him. You love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, I, it's been a while since I like really vacationed on Memorial Day weekend. Did you, Have you done anything fun this weekend besides no. making sure you're around to hold down your duties as a podcaster on Sunday and Monday nights? Exactly. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm one of the more boring people when it comes to major holidays. You know, I, I pretty much just maintain my normal schedule. So I hope everyone else had a good weekend. I hope you had an exciting weekend, Chad, relatively speaking. But yeah, I was uh, pretty boring. So I know one person who had a particularly unique and exciting weekend, and that would be none other than MHH's Lance Sanderson. Shout out. Got married. He and his wife now, Samantha, tied the knot. So congrats to the Sanderson fam. Yes, very cool to see. If you're connected with Lance on Facebook anyway, you saw some of it I know got streamed, so that was cool. I'm glad he did that for those of us who couldn't make it to, to the wedding. But, yeah, you know, Memorial Day, dude, I – the last two years of my life is the are the first two years that I've actually vacationed. Last year, went to Florida for a week, took the whole family to Florida. This year, went to Hawaii. But otherwise, dude, I don't vacation. Like I work every single. I work seven days a week, three sixty five. You know, like my dad. When you live in the Rockies, you know, it's like, hey, go enjoy the the mountains, go enjoy the lakes and the outer doors and all that. And my dad's always trying to get me to go, but I can't, dude. I, I'm like connected to the internet. I have to be, so do you, 24-7. It's hard to disconnect. It's it's more, it becomes more, Zach, than just a, an addiction when you do this for a living. Like you become driven and it's like, if you don't have access to it, it's like phantom limb. Yeah, FOMO for me kicks in for sure. Every time on the rare occasion I do vacation, um, but people understand that it's a seven day a week grind. It's a 365 day grind covering the NFL, covering an NFL team. People think that when the season ends, that everything slows down to a crawl. No, there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on. People think well, they don't practice nothing to write about. You shouldn't write. Well, there's always something to write. There's always something you should be doing. So I'm right there with you on that grinders. It's funny because when people find out, you know, you meet someone like, uh, your wife's cousin's husband or something that you never oh what do you do oh you know here's what i do i cover the Denver broncos right oh really dope that's cool too they want to know all about it right and then he's like well what do you do in the off season well it turns out the network they sell ads and guess what they don't care if you, there's no football on they still want you publishing content because they sold ads and those ads need impressions and if you're not getting people to read your stuff even during the off season but see fortunately for guys like us we love the off season the period we're about to hit is my only yeah. sliver of the NFL calendar that I don't relish or look forward right. to. I mean, it just, it is what it is. And it, we're approaching that six week vacation where there's no OTAs drafts over free agencies over seasons coming training camps coming six weeks, Zach of utter nothing to really like write about in terms of like news remarks, things coming out that you can analyze. You got to really get creative. That's the hardest part really about our job. Honestly, is that six week stretch. You don't want any news to come out because that's bad news if that comes out during that six week period. It's either an arrest or some other incident. Yep. So the, no news is good news during that six weeks. But for us, it makes our job a little harder. We do recognize the players need some time off. They basically train and work year round. That's their only respite until January, hopefully February in the Broncos case. But I'm just taking it day by day. We still have OTA practices upcoming. We still have the uh, mandatory mini camp in mid June. So let's ride. Yes, indeed. Shout out to Patrick jumping in early. It's great to see you, my friend. Maybe I'll just call you CP, like the Denver Broncos secondary coach, Christian Parker. That's what they call him. CP, what's going on, big dog? Appreciate you. Good to see you. I see uh, Diamond Rattler in the house. I see Jimmy Sauber jumping in early on YouTube. Jay uh, Calvante, that's a newer name. Oh, this is kind of cool. Check this out. I've only been able to watch two or three shows live, and this is my first in a while. Scott and Nick are the goats, he says, but I'll all love to everyone at MHH and the fans. <laughs> this is Scott's burner account. I'm just kidding, bro. I'm just kidding, bro. Um, Nick and Scott are goats. Before I saw it was Chad and Zach. Oops, they are goaded also. <laughs> it's all good, dude. Hey, everybody, we're just happy you like you like MHH for real. It's all good. We're we're happy that you've connected. Um, 
with us. N- so. Nice save, Calavante. Nice save. <laughs> you know, we, we see right through that. Yeah. But I had, you know, just to poke some fun at it, I did have Scott bah like a like a goat before the show started. So he 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 earned the title. Put it that way. <laughs> Uh, just a few other hellos here, and we'll get into some content. I just want to say what's up. Uh, Sam Bam, throwing down a super chat Good early. Good to see you, Sam. Thank you. Helping uh, keep the lights on here for the football priest. We love that. Thank you, buddy. He says, Good evening, Chad and Zach. Hope all is well. 15 Sundays. He's counting to go until week one. Go Broncos. Fortunately, on my end, Zach, aside from the job itself, I got a lot going on this summer that's going to keep me busy. The time's going to gonna fly but yeah it'll be here before you know it 15 sundays it seems like that's all there is but um i don't care about sundays i care about mondays so whatever 15 mondays from tomorrow is the broncos week one game i just i can't wait i literally cannot wait for this season so pumped there is truth here to what chase says chad you're always on vacation when you're with us it's true like if you can crack this code you have hacked into the matrix and you've you know you've won the game which is if you can find a way to even make any money doing something that to you is you do it for free and you do it for free like i got into this business doing it strictly for free for fun just because i like to do it and it grew into something so if it doesn't feel like work zach and somewhere along the way you're getting paid for it that's you've hacked the matrix you've cracked the code you're onto something don't look that gift horse in the mouth. As the great Heath Ledger said in The Dark Knight, if you're good at something, never do it for free. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. We're, we're fortunate enough that we don't have to worry about that, but it's it's people like you, Chase, that uh, in, interact with us and uh, communicate with us that make it all the worthwhile. So thank you. Um, you know, there are a few stories that have, uh, John, good to see you, buddy, that published over the weekend that we can get to, some cool remarks, different things that have been said coming out of OTAs, Zach. But, I think first and foremost, I titled tonight's episode around a series that's got launched over the weekend at milehighhuddle.com, which is simply Broncos on the bubble. And you can look at the the Denver Broncos 90 man roster right now and come up with a, you know, almost 40 dudes who are are on the bubble, right? Because only 53 guys are going to make it in the final analysis. But in terms of the guys who either have, Zach, some veteran experience, you know, or in other words, tenure um sizable salary cap hit and or draft pedigree there's a handful of dudes i want to get your thoughts on who i feel like are plausible bubble guys and i want to start with the first one that we published over the weekend and that is second year safety jamar johnson the kid whom the broncos drafted uh in the fifth round last year out of indiana you and i were really geeked up about this guy because he was just such an exciting ball hawk we knew going in that tackling wasn't his forte, but you go to a, a team at the time that is led by Vic Fangio, a defensive-minded guy, tackling is non-negotiable, to quote old Vic. We knew that that should, if the kid is uh, earnest, sincere, passionate about pro career, tackling is something that should get cleaned up in the relative uh, quick. But unfortunately, we didn't really get to see if that came out in the wash much, Zach, because He got put on the COVID list early in summer that significantly interrupted his uh, whatever momentum he had as a fifth round pick. Then you get through the preseason and he's way behind the eight ball. So aside from seeing him play a few defensive snaps, but mostly special teams in preseason, we didn't see him. Then he got hurt. He made the 53, but then he got hurt. Uh, He was basically a, a healthy scratch each and every week. Then he got hurt. Then he came back and then he finally saw a few special team snaps. But Zach, he did not register a single statistic box score statistic as a rookie jamar johnson i believe is on the bubble this year for multiple reasons do you agree yes or no and if so why i just roll my eyes at any vic fangio saying no death by inches you know i guess losing was non-negotiable too for old vic I love Jamar Johnson coming out. I thought he was going to be what Caden Stearns proved to be opposite Simmons and in rotation with Kareem Jackson it, it's so tough, though, when you're a raw, younger player desperately in need of reps and you're behind the eight ball for months and months at a time. That was Jamar Johnson. And maybe he got in Vic Fangio's doghouse. We know McTelvin Ajim has been in there for the last couple of years. It is possible you can be stuck in there. And I hope the new coaching staff with Evero, who was a secondary coach, by the way, in L.A., can mine the potential of Jamar Johnson. 
I don't, I don't think he's on the bubble because this regime drafted him. I know the coaching staff didn't, but George Payton did. So there's some loyalty. Also, you need a, a fixture opposite Simmons in the long term. That's not Kareem Jackson. Could be Caden Stearns, but it could not be Caden Stearns either. I, I think he's relatively safe, depending on how many safeties the Broncos keep. They, Of course, they drafted Yell. They have P.J. Locke, who they like. I want to say he's safe, but maybe that's my bias because I like the player. I think he could be something if given the opportunity. If he's safe, that's the reason why. And it's simply the connection that he's part of George Payton's maiden draft class. And if you look at that draft class, he's one of the few guys that really didn't make an impact as a rookie. But I think aside from what I've already said and what you've already said that goes against him is, yeah, you got to kind of hedge for and protect against uh, the future. But you look at this year. All right, Justin Simmons, locked in. Kareem Jackson, locked in for this year. Caden Stearns locked in. Then what? Jamar Johnson was so ill um, exposed to the to the NFL game last year that I mean he's on the basically the same starting foot as a rookie. Meanwhile, Delon or uh, Deller and pardon me, Turner Yo and PJ Locke has been like people have been buzzing about PJ Locke. And I get it's only OTAs. And he's always kind of been a firecracker type of personality, PJ Locke. So for what that's worth, but when you have two, the Broncos don't have too many Pro Bowlers, right? The guys on the roster that have been to a Pro Bowl, but two of their few guys that have, both this week, raving about P.J. Locke. So how many safeties do you keep? Well, that roster math ends up getting informed by how many D. linemen did you keep? How many outside backers? How many off-ball guys? And so on and so forth. But unless, and I hope it happens, by the way, what I'm about to say, unless Jamar really takes the bull by the horns and pops this year, this summer, I mean, like training camp and preseason, I think he's going to get squeezed off. But he's got some really intriguing talent as a as a ball guy. Like he goes and gets the ball, not just like, hey, I'm going to be there, tackle the guy, try and interrupt the pass. No, dude, he goes and gets the ball. That was one of the really intriguing things about him coming out of Indiana, but he just hasn't had any luck. Yeah, or uh, opportunity. And it sucks when he's, again, behind the eight ball with injuries and uh, learning a, a complex defense like Vic Fangio's. I feel bad for Jamar, but that's the name of the game. Availability is the best ability for any player. Hayden Stearns had more availability. P.J. Locke so far is grasping, it sounds like, the defense. I, I thought it was funny. I, can't, I think Nick said it, too, on his podcast that Cortland Sutton was asked all these questions and randomly P.J. Locke was thrown in there. He was asked about P.J. Locke. So he's been this hawk. Locke has. PJ, not true, of OTA so far. And uh, if that continues, like you said, Chad, you drafted a safety who I don't think you're going to cut to put on the practice squad. You might be right about Jamar. I don't, I don't want to admit that he might be cut, but I think I'm leaning in that direction if he held a gun to my head. And remember, I'm not the, the purpose of these conversations is not to advocate for one of these guys to get cut. Just, right. hey, the sky's blue. These guys are on the bubble. It's and whether – whether that read is correct or not is is really what we're going to get to the bottom of here tonight. GLP in the house. What's up, bro? Says you guys are good at what you do, MHH for life. Thank you, Gary. You are most kind, GLP. We really do appreciate You're it. You're great at what you do, Gary, which is being amazing. That's so, right, bro. Um, Christopher, good to have you in the chat, my friend. Uh, just flashing a few names here. Uh, <laughs> look, we got Chad's shiny marble. That, that That's how <laughs> my – you've got Peyton Manning's forehead. And then Chad's shiny marble in terms of legendary status. Uh, but has a he says, I have returned, but has a winning culture. Does this team feel like a playoff team to you? We still have a few names to get to tonight, Zach. But as a quick uh, aside, does this team feel like a playoff team to you? It's so hard on May 29th to say if it's going to be a playoff team. They have to play the games. I want to see how this rookie coaching staff comes together, how Hackett – kind of molds a lot of veteran talent, youthful talent together. It's a big responsibility. It's a big job ahead of Hackett. I think he can do it. But, yeah, how do you not look at a healthy Broncos team? That's the key word here, healthy Broncos team with Russell freaking Wilson, at quarterback, and Hackett bringing that energy and rejuvenation back to the sideline and better play calling on offense. How do you not think of the Broncos, review the Broncos as a playoff team? I don't know again. I'll preface it like I always do. I don't know if it means winning the West or going to the Super Bowl or the AFC title game, but I do think they will make the playoffs. I think 11 and six is a realistic expectation for Denver this season. I do too. I think the Broncos are going to be a factor, but I think fans who are like going to sleep and saying, you know, Hey, this is like the days of Peyton Manning where we can just like sleep through the summer. 
sleep through September, October. No, it's basically wake me up in December and then the playoffs. It's not that level of guaranteed automatica. All right. And the reason being not anything against Russ, like Russ is a tide that can raise all ships. All right. Just like Peyton. But the big difference here is it's a first year head coach, not just a guy that's a head coach for the first time in Denver. This is the first time Nathaniel Hackett's ever been a head coach and has had to juggle all the demands. And so that to me is the one thing where it's like, hey, Broncos fans, be excited, be optimistic, have expectations, but be paying attention, be be closely following this thing, because if there's anything that's going to be a fly in the ointment of this team moving forward, it's that in terms of what exists now. Who knows if injuries could strike at the wrong situation. That's not really what I'm getting at, but don't sleep on that possibility. But I still see this Denver Broncos squad as a worst to first Cinderella turnaround type situation. You are 100% right when you said they can't go to sleep until December and wake up and play football. They have to earn that. They have to earn that right and earn that status. Peyton Manning and those teams did. We think maybe Russell Wilson and Hackett can get there, but they're not there yet. They have to first even topple Kansas City in their division to prove they are the supreme team, let alone getting that kind of uh, benefit of the doubt. So we'll see how it plays out, but Chad and I are both very confident in the Broncos' prospects. Ben, before we grab your question, I'm just going to flash and show everybody what the uh, top five is right now currently on Facebook. As you know, gang, we're trying to reach 200,000 stars this month of May, which there's today, there's tomorrow, and then there's the next day. That's all that's left. And you can see on the ticker below where we're at on the goal. We're not even to 50%. So it's going to be, it's looking pretty dim, our hopes of reaching goal. But if we reach the goal, we're going to do what we've always done. And that is raffle off a Broncos jersey to, of the winner's choosing. And the only people in the running for that raffle are those who contributed to the goal. So the more someone helped contribute, the more tickets they're going to have in the hat and so on. Gary Leeds Palmer currently still in the pole position here in this month of May, followed closely behind by Mark Schrader. Tim Hoffman, Phil McLaughlin, and Jacob, the silent one, Foster. So there is your update, gang, on Facebook. And with that being said, let's grab the question here um, from Ben. Who do you think, he says, will be, and by the way, thank you, Ben. Appreciate the support, big dog. Who do you think will be the first surprise cut this year? Zach, it's hard to foresee those type of things because obviously it's a surprise, right? So... Uh, if we can anticipate the surprise, then it's not a surprise by definition. But what's a name that you could see being shown the door that would surprise fans? Would Sam Martin qualify <laughs> as a surprise name? I don't know. He's a starting punter. And I they got competition for him in there. Right. So I think that's one guy whose salary doesn't really align with uh, his production. I think Sam Martin could be a bubble player, surprise cut. I'm just trying to go through the positions where the Broncos are, are most fortified, you know, uh, linebacker or outside linebacker, wide receiver. I don't think they're going to cut any receiver. I mean, would Tyree Cleveland qualify as a surprise cut to get rid of someone like him? I don't really see any surprise guys. Let me throw a name at you. Malik Reed. I was thinking him. Now, off the cuff, you might immediately recoil against the notion of the Broncos cutting the guy that's only two years removed from leading the team in sacks. And we're talking about the same year that Bradley Chubb made a Pro Bowl. It was Malik Reed who led the team in sacks. But when you look at, at the way the dominoes are kind of falling, Zach, you got a heavy investment in Bradley Chubb, at least for this year. Heavier investment in Randy Gregory for the next five years, even though, you know, they can get out of the contract within the first couple of years or so. But so big dollars invested at the top. So now you've got this top heavy depth chart. They didn't say we're good. Let's go ahead and let Malik Reed kind of be the leader of that next group. They went out and used their first pick in this draft, which albeit was pick 64 on an edge rusher and Nick Benito. Then you got Jonathan Cooper, who flashed last year. You got some other interesting guys like Christopher Allen, the undrafted rookie whom, from Alabama that they gave a lot of money. So depending on how those young guys coalesce in camp this summer and in the preseason, it would not surprise me to see a veteran on an RFA tender, which those are not guaranteed anymore, by the way, the RFA tenders, wouldn't surprise me to see him get the boot. Yeah, I was when I went through edge rusher in my head, I'm thinking maybe Malik Reed. I, Cooper has more upside to me as a backup um, edge rusher. A couple other names we mentioned him already. I think it would qualify as Jamar Johnson. I mean, mm -hmm. he drafted him last year. He was a playmaking safety. I think that would qualify as a surprise and a true surprise. I don't agree with. I don't advocate for Lloyd Cushenberry. Mm. Maybe we'll see. 
We shout Sam Bam with super chat number two, proven that he is a Mount Rushmore member of our yes. community here at MHH. Thank you, Sam. And Sam, dude, I forget now what your real name is. Have we ever gotten this dude's real name? Sam Bam. Well, he's Sam Bam to us, but that stands for SAM and then Broncos, yeah. Braves, and is it Mavericks, I want to say? That's his three favorite teams. Um, either way, we would like to say thank you for your support. You know, it's a small thing we can do. If you and we might have done this in the past, but I delete emails to keep my email clean. So shoot us an email, milehighhuddle at gmail.com with your personal details, your address, t shirt size. Let us send you a little something, something, some swag, MHH swag, some huddle up swag as a thank you for the. I mean, just you're consistent, dude. And we, this time of year especially, we need that and we appreciate that, buddy. He says, Do you see this being a make or break season for Bradley Chubb? And what do you think his Broncos future is, Zach? How do you not see a make or break season for Bradley Chubb? If it, he he defines what it means to be at the crossroads of his career, you're talking about a top five draft pick who has not come close to living up to that draft status. He showed as a rookie what he could be, and then injuries kind of derailed his career. Absolutely, it's a make or break season. It should benefit the Broncos because if Bradley Chubb wants to return or wants a contract, wants a future in the NFL, he will put his you-know-what on the table and perform this year and maybe get back to that rookie uh, rookie level where he had 12 sacks. So, yeah, make or break. Broncos' future is tied to his production. They signed Randy Gregory, and then they doubled down. That's what's interesting. They needed a guy to replace Von Miller. I understand that. But when their first draft pick is Nick Benito, an edge rusher, that wasn't a good sign for Bradley Chubb's future. And we said that. We looked at each other, Chad, in Vegas when they made that pick, and we said, adios, Bradley. If you don't step up and perform, that's what's going to happen to you. So, if he goes back to that 2018 level, I can see him getting a second contract, though. How much money can go around for one position if you're paying Gregory and you know, you're going to have to maybe pay Nick Benito down the road. But if he doesn't perform, if he gets hurt again, they will absolutely walk away as they should. Your two questions are indeed tied together. I mean, it's if Bradley Chubb doesn't play starter snaps this year, and with those starter snaps produce at a level that justifies his draft pedigree and the fact that he's playing on a fifth-year contract as a former top-five pick, he will not be a Bronco this time next year. That is a near fact. And, Tommy, as, as much as we love you, buddy, we do love you. You know, in the co you're in the chat every single night. Uh, sometimes a little too – what's the good word for it, Scott? A little too persistent? I don't know. But – we love you nonetheless. You're there every every night. We appreciate it. This is not a correct take, though. I got to pull your card. All right, here's why. Jamar Johnson is a fifth-round pick one year removed that saw basically zero playtime on defense. McTelvin Ajim is a third-round pick, Zach, three years removed from the previous regime. So you start seeing these degrees of separation from the current brain trust, and you go, okay, yeah, maybe I could see it. But McTelvin Ajim, from everybody uh, I've talked to, from the buzz, people in the know, sources, whatnot, the Broncos actually have some pretty high hopes for McTelvin Ajim this year. Like, you've got a starting job locked down by Draymond Jones. you got a starting job locked down by DJ Jones. That next opening, the Broncos are hopeful that M Ajim is ready to kind of – because it takes two to three years for D-linemen. Hey, the silent one in the house. Jacob, what's up, bro? Good to see you. Appreciate you, my friend takes two or three years for D-linemen to blossom in the league. And guess what? That's where Ajim's at. And kind of found himself in the doghouse a little bit with Fangio, but he did get to see playing time on defense. Nowhere near Zach as much as you would hope, especially with a guy of his draft pedigree. But I just don't think there's been enough water under that bridge for the team yet to justify moving on from a premium round draft pick. The only exception to that I could see is if he completely fails to launch, like, not just eh, it doesn't kind of stand out, but like dereliction of duty, you know, pulls a Carlos Henderson, you move on type thing. Brendan Langley, you move on. I don't see that happening, though, because from a character perspective, he's high in high standing. He's smart, great football IQ. It's just a matter of maximizing his opportunity. And I think this is the year he's really going to get one. I agree with you. Um, your premise and what you're saying, I do. If I could straw man for a second, though. He wasn't drafted by George Payton. We talked yeah. about Jamar Johnson. You know, there's no loyalty to McTelvin Ajim. And I just wonder, Chad, and you're right with what you said, and he, he has at least gotten some playing time. And there's something there, we hope. But where does he fit in? I mean, the Broncos have brought in so many defensive linemen this offseason. DJ Jones, Awuzurike, Henningsen, 
Uh, Deshaun Williams, they brought back. They have Mike Purcell still. Where does McTelvin Najim fit into that rotation? And will he fit in? What role could he have? So I could see him being on the bubble for sure. I will say that. Dale, it, hey, dude, you're in the chat early. You're throwing down a super chat. Thank you, buddy. And by the way, I know we're going to get the question. Oh, he says, it didn't let me write my chat. Sorry, it's such a small. Hey, dude, don't worry about that. It all adds up, my dog. So thank you. We don't turn our nose up at anything like that, my friend. Seriously, thank you. Um, Big T, Travis Weber in the hizzy. He says, I see a Jeem and Natani Muti being possible cuts. I and agreed know. on Malik Reed. Let's get to another couple of names on the list here of bubble guys. And by the way, real quick, um, Albert, circle the San Francisco game. That's when we're going to do our meet and greet at home. All right. Uh, I'll pull up the date here in a minute, but I'm just throwing that out. That's when we're going to do the meet and greet in Denver. It would be crazy. Okay. Um, can, can I say something real quick, Chad, yeah, about Mikel Benajim before we transition over? Yeah. I would look to trade him. If you're not going to keep him on the 53, maybe another team can give up a seventh round conditional pick for him, something to take on his potential. I would not write cut Ajim or um, who is the other one he mentioned? Moody, for that matter. I try to get something for them, something. There has to be some pick that can go around for a player like that, a young player, ascending player. Moody is another guy. And look, no offense if Mama Moody is watching tonight. I don't know. I haven't seen her in the chat. But um, before we get Andrew here. Natani Muti was a guy that up until a week ago, Zach, I was very doubtful on his prospects for 22. But hearing Nathaniel Hackett kind of gush. Now, Nathaniel Hackett, in the same way of a John Gruden when John was a color analyst at Monday, on Monday Night Football, you know, player name comes up and they're going to gush. Like that's kind of what his personality is. Vic Fangio, for example, was the polar opposite of that. Like, you had to really ask the right question and it really had to be the right guy that that dude actually really did love for him to kind of open up and, and you could see in how he talked and in the content of what he said in his tonality, Vic loves this dude. It feels like Nathaniel Hackett loves everybody. So let's go ahead and put that out there as setting the table. He said some really noteworthy things about Natani Muti this past week. Most specific being that, He's a very huge human and he can run. So for those of us and myself included, I'm putting myself in that camp that doubted Muti's athletic wherewithal to fit in the zone scheme and, and all that doesn't sound like that's going to be a problem, at least according to Hackett. So then you get back to his, he's a power guy. You know, if he can actually thrive in a zone and you combine that with like with Quinn Miners power and athleticism, maybe he is a guy that sticks, but um, I could see him as a as a kind of pet project of the previous O line coach, yeah. not finding as much favor. But at the same time, last thing, and then I'm serving it back. His kind of personality and that exuberance, and he's such a team guy. I know all coaches do appreciate that. So even though we know Mike Munchak loved him as a project and a guy that dropped to the sixth round that he believed had day two, you know, traits. He's got that energy and that excitement that is just infectious that coaches, I think, across the, the board are going to appreciate. You know, for he, we know he's a mauler. That's not in dispute. That's his type of game. He, he's an animal on the field. The only question is, could he run? And Hackett answered that with gusto, that he can run. So he checked that box off, and that was important. There is utility to a player like Natani Muti. I, I was a bigger fan of him than most. I, I liked what I saw from him in his lim limited sample size. I hope. Butch Barry is a fan of him and, and it's the scheme they're going to implement. I hope he sticks around and gets a chance on the interior. But they did bring in um, a guard, Luke Wattenberg, and they brought in uh, Ben Braden as well. So, yep, not a great sign. Uh, Andrew Baker, what's up, bro? Appreciate you, my friend. He says, every game matters and our opener could set the tone for the season. So how important is it that we beat Seattle right away? If we lose that one, it could be detrimental to the season. MHH for life. I don't think it's so much um, – the fact that it's the first game, I think it's the fact that it's the Seahawks. Right. So right now, no matter how neutral, you know, we learned about this from, from Kim Becker, shout out beckoning the Broncos on Wednesday mornings that he cultivates, does Russ, this neutral mindset. And as cool as that is, and there's a lot to learn on that topic. And I think there's a lot to that people can take for themselves that could be helpful in, in our own lives. But, um, he's kind of haunted by a demon right now. And that is this legend he built in Seattle. 
And if he beats the Seahawks and he beats the Chargers this year, he becomes a, one of a small handful of quarterbacks to have beaten all 32 teams. And then he would also, if he does it this year, become the youngest quarterback ever to have defeated all 32 teams in the NFL. But see, it's more than that to me, Zach. You've got to get the monkey off your back. You've got to exercise the demon. If you really are that alpha, if you really are that franchise quarterback and that rare exception to the rule, which states that franchise quarterbacks are not traded, you got to go out there and lambast, vanquish the Seahawks and exercise that demon. Well, this isn't where if they lose this game, their season's automatically over, but they no. have to win this game. They have to win this freaking game. God help Nathaniel Hackett. God help Russell Wilson. They lose to Seattle on Monday night at Seattle to Drew Locke or to Geno Smith. God help the Broncos if that happened. It would set an awful, awful tone for the season. And their earlier stretch of, of the year, the first eight games or so, that's the easy stretch, quote-unquote. They have to take advantage of the teams they're supposed to beat. They are supposed to beat the Seahawks. They're three-and-a-half-point favorites. There is no reason why, in fact, they should lose this game, but they have to win it. They have to. Uh, real quick, while I have the schedule pulled up, as you guys can see, week three, all right, that's September 25th. And what's cool about this, Zach, is it's a Sunday night game. All right, so it's an evening game. It's going to still be nice weather. So we're going to be able to actually hang out at the meet and greet longer. You know, if you, if it's a traditional 2 p.m. kick for the Broncos or 2.20, whatever, um, you know, the, the lot doesn't open till 10 a.m. And so you, you only have kind of a smaller window with which to kind of hang out and uh, – Partay to quote Sinbad, but in this case, it's going to be evening. So, barring just like terrible weather, that plays right into our hands in terms of making it the perfect uh, setting for the meet and greet. So, put that in. It's going to have some cool storylines. Not only a quality opponent, Zach, but Niners and C and uh, Russell Wilson's history against them as a Seahawk and all that's going to come into play. So, this will be the first one, and we'll get back to you guys on what we're going to do for the second one, but. Start putting that in your calendars, as many of you as, as can make it. I mean, Zach, last year we saw guys from Georgia. We saw guys drive from Everywhere. Palm Springs, California, yeah. flying up from all over the country and the world. We the, One dude, uh, Ricardo, from Mexico City yeah. that came. So cool. But that should give you enough time now, guys, to start planning if you want to come hang out with myself, Zach, Scott Kennedy. Um, did I mention Scott Kennedy? Uh, Nick Kendall, Eric, you know, come, come hang out with the MHH dudes. It'll be literally cooler too, because the last game, it was a little hot outside. We were sweating a, a little bit, but it didn't dampen anything. It was an incredible opportunity uh, and experience that Chad and I still talk about to this day quite uh, uh, often, in fact. So we can't wait for it. Looking forward to that game. Kyle Shanahan, baby, versus the Broncos versus Russell Wilson. Get hype. Travis, thank you for your patience, big dog. He says, if Chubb doesn't perform well in camp, do you see Denver shopping him no. immediately? Zach, you have a pretty strong opinion on this out of the gates. What are your thoughts? Who's going to start if they trade him? That's my answer. It's like, is Nick Benito ready to start a full-time role from day one? Is Randy Gregory coming off surgery? Can he hold up for 17 games? If he doesn't perform well, you have to hold on to him. You're already paying him, so why not see if that he'll step up during the regular season? They're not going to shop him. I, I'd be really surprised if they shopped him at training camp. Maybe, maybe, maybe midseason bef before the trade deadline, they might make some phone calls, but they need him. They need Bradley Chubb to step up this year badly. They really do. Um, I just don't see it just because they're on the hook for that fifth year. And not to say that they wouldn't have potentially some takers out there, but Aside from just clearing that money off your cap, I'm not sure what you'd get in return because I don't think his value uh, would be right. round one or round two as far as a trade. So it'd be more about clearing the cap space. I mean, what would you get, if, especially if he didn't perform well at camp? Exactly. I mean, all 32 teams get those those cut-ups each day. They're going to be able to see if he didn't have a good camp. I think, though, Zach, you're on the right train of thought here. None of that really is why he's not going to get traded. Why he's not going to get traded is you don't have – someone that you can really trust that's better than him. Even if he doesn't have a great camp, better than Malik Reed, better than Jonathan Cooper, better than what Nick Benito is today. Right. And the compliment, Randy Gregory, who you just paid, isn't hundo. So if, if Gregory was a hundo, I could see it being more of a thing. But Gregory's coming off that shoulder, so I agree with you. 
Yeah, that was my other point. It's like if he has a bad camp and he's a free agent after the season and he's expensive for this year, why would a team take that on? It, they wouldn't give up more than what? A fourth round pick for Bradley Chubb at that point is is losing a starter worth gaining a fourth round pick? Not to me. I, I would be stunned if they shopped him uh, this summer. All right, let me throw another bubble guy out at you. All right, as I uh, go through a, a list of these names here. Mike Purcell, all right? Mm-hmm. Now, this is a cat that, the Denver Broncos uh, could save some serious dollars on the salary cap if they move on from him. Um, We've kind of already talked a lot about what the background of the D-line looks like in terms of the players here. But Awuzarike just got drafted. They're expecting big things from Sosa, Ajim. Uh, Deshaun Williams came back on a small one-year team-friendly deal. And meanwhile, Mike Purcell is counting for four and some change a million on the cap, and he just simply hasn't been even close to the dude he was pre Liz Frank injury, which he suffered, you know, towards the end of the first quarter of the of the 2020 season. He just hasn't been that same guy. He's definitely, to me, Zach, no longer worth. I mean, the 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 caliber he was before the injury worth the money the Broncos gave him. I did I didn't pick any nits on that contract at the time but he just hasn't been able to bounce back to that form from the injury. So I think this is a guy that you kind of have to assume the Broncos have earmarked as a red, you know, sore thumb type situation where he needs to kind of really show out this summer and take to this coaching staff and take to the scheme and play discipline. Cause that was one of the big things about him is, you know, sometimes you got a two gap, you got to stand your guy up and be ready to hit the gap to your left or the gap to the right. And sometimes too often he'd be too aggressive trying to shoot the gap and then the play could go right around him and he'd blow it and it'd be an eight yard gain. And if he would have just stayed disciplined, Broncos would have had that, you know, buttoned up, but I don't see him being very comfortable in his slumber between now and let's say beginning of September. No, I'm pulling it up right now from over the cap. If they make him a post June for post June first cut, the Broncos, they would gain $3.573 million in cap savings and only $774,000 in dead money. Yeah, that's a roster bubble cut candidate if I ever saw one. They drafted players like you mentioned, Chad. They have a lot of players on their front seven that can stop the run. And nose tackle nowadays is a very much a devalued position. It's going the way of the dodo bird. You need linemen that can do more and play all around the line, not just at one position. So, yeah, that's a guy I could see getting cut for sure or maybe traded. But then again, who's going to take on his salary? It comes back to that. We talked about Awuzarike, the fourth round pick, but there's also this kid who, before we write him off as a sixth rounder that is unlikely, let's say, to you know make an impact early. This dude, let me read this from Trickle. Uh, Henningsen worked hard to make it at Wisconsin and was the first walk-on in Badgers history to start a season opener since 1990, and that was in 2018. So the dude has a work ethic, Zach, that probably shouldn't be slept on. It's just more pressure on Purcell, and then we'll grab Chase here. I think Henningsen is a practice squad guy in year one. I mean, he's a guy who needs a year at least, and he might not ever pan out, but he's a a worthy flyer, and it just is not good news when they bring in DJ Jones and they drafted a Wuzuriki and they drafted Henningsen. If you're a guy like Mike Purcell or McTelvin Ajim, you're thinking, "Uh uh-oh. Chase, appreciate that super chat, big dog. Really, we do. He says, when did we last have only two active quarterbacks on game day was it the manning era now i'm not certain on this but i want to say there was some during the keenum year i don't think they kept three because think about it who was it behind him so when they moved on from chad kelly they also previously to that at the end of the summer moved on from paxton lynch who was the backup after they cut chad kelly now that i think about it I don't know. Can't remember too much. Uh, too much mediocrity. We're like yeah, overwhelmed yeah. here. Um, Russell Wilson is the answer to every question, though. Anyway, but I think it might have been two. Then, yeah, that's now that's going to bother me. Who was Case Keenum's backup? Uh, pre or post Chad Kelly getting shown the door, guys. Uh, There's only two uh, quarterbacks listed on the roster. No, it wasn't Slaughter. It's Kelly and Keenum. No, they did something different after Kelly, though. Dang it. Well, uh, anyway, but I think it was then. So for what it's worth. 
Um, that's bugging me. Who was it? 2018. So that was the year that preceded Drew. Uh, and Flacco came in that next off season. The last VJ year. Kevin Hogan. Thank you. I it had was to look Kevin it up. Hogan. It was Kevin Hogan. So yeah, that Brock was, was they did. Kevin Hogan. Right, <laughs> indeed. But they did run two or uh, dress two in that yeah. period of time. All right. Let's talk more about real quick bubble guys. And by the way, whatever's on your mind, y'all, you know, uh, like this from Lawrence Rivera, get it in the chat. We'll do the best we can to get to you. Uh, the super chat superstars and the star supporters on Facebook are going to take precedence. You guys know that um, like Lawrence here. Yo, Chad, I think you hit it on the nose for Melvin Gordon, not wanting to show up to practice. I think it's so he doesn't lose reps due to not being what he once was. I think it's a PR move on his part. I don't remember asserting that as a take. Did I assert that as a take that he doesn't want to lose no. reps? I think that's either his way. Take. Either way. Um, Lawrence, it's all good. Let's talk about it though. Melvin Gordon not showing up. We don't know the reason. Like he maybe he had something going on and the, the podcast he just doesn't. thing. He, he never had. He just doesn't believe in showing up to voluntary OTs. It's really as simple as that. Probably true. Probably true. Javante Williams is going to run away with this one, I think. Yeah. And Melvin's going to have a role. Don't get me wrong. They brought him back and they gave him two and a half million bucks or whatever it was. Zach, you know, that'll he's got an opportunity to make more. But I think this the coaching staff knows who's uh, in for a dime, in for a dollar, and it's Javante. And you couldn't be if, – if that is your guy that is in for a dime, in for a dollar, you, you couldn't be luckier. I mean, that dude is smart between the years, brutal runner in terms of – guys just don't want to tackle him, dude. I, I picked up some buzz from just around the NFL like – He's a guy that teams defenses when it comes time to start prepping for the Broncos on the schedule this week, they're like, Oh man, Javante, damn, dude. This is gonna be a drag because he he doesn't just go down, dude, and he he looks to inflict uh the pain rather than absorb it or whatever. But I think Javante is gonna run away with this job and Gordon will be the number two, but his only hope of of Changing that equation would have, I think, is to like fully show this coaching staff his investment and commitment, especially as a late summer ad, you know, or I should say a late spring addition, because this coaching staff doesn't know Melvin Gordon from Adam, right? I mean, they have his tape from the last two years or whatever, but like we're not talking about uh, Curtis Modkins being a holdover who's going to be trying to assert his cause for you know, playing because he's been there the last two years. No, no, no. This is it's new on the offensive side. So if I'm Melvin, I know I just got the contract. So maybe I'm feeling, you know, kind of at ease a little bit, but like, dude, you're you're fixing to become your obsolescence is on the horizon unless you really attack this. And maybe we're making too much out of it. It's summer or it's you know, it's OTA voluntary mini camp, but I don't think so. We're not making enough out of it, Chad. His contract is incentive-based, is rep-based, and he doesn't come for the first set of OTAs this offseason. You know who was there? Javante was there. Mike Boone was there. Demarie freaking Crockett was there. Who Melvin Gordon isn't after begging to come back to the Broncos. If that's a PR move on his part, he should fire all his representatives because that's a terrible career decision to purposely hold out a voluntary OTAs with no excuse. There's no reason why he wasn't hurt. At least Kareem Jackson, he went to his daughter's graduation. It's a family obligation. That's one thing. But Melvin Gordon in his career, which precedes the Broncos when he played for the Chargers, he never shows up to OTAs. I don't think that's a sign of a good leader. You know, you say it's it, it's it's May. It doesn't matter much, but it shows who he is at heart. And we always use the word mercenary with Melvin Gordon. I don't think that's changed much. It is definitely a mercenary type mindset, in my opinion. Um Back to the bubble guys here, Zach. We're at 45 minutes, so we got to start winding it down here shortly. But let me get your thoughts on this cat, all right? Justin Sternod. Now, at first glance, I think it's a little bit easy to write him off. But I was, as I was kind of writing this up, I ran into a few logical fallacies in terms of, you know, the Broncos didn't bring back A.J. Johnson. They did bring back Jewel. They're thinking about moving Baron Browning to edge. It's not as deep of a 
position group as you might think at first glance in terms of like proven guys. It's basically Josie Jewell, uh, Jonas Griffith, Alex Singleton, and Justin Sternod because you don't know what the plan is quite yet for Baron Browning. And then Barrington Wade gets thrown in in the um, – What's his name? Mauga, the kid you wrote about yeah. having a brain fart, but undrafted rookie. Um, Justin Sternod's situation isn't as perilous as his play was last year. In other words, like I could see the Broncos talking themselves into holding on to him just because he's been around now a couple, two, three years, and you know they need a little bit of depth there. But if we were basing this purely on the normal things like salary cap. Uh, draft pedigree and overall relative uh, wherewithal. This is a guy that to me, Zach, I'll be surprised. I would be surprised if he's on the roster come the final 53 cut down. The answer is right in front of you. Look at that picture. I mean, he's getting outran by freaking D Ernest Johnson of, of the Cleveland Browns, not you know Kareem Hunter, Nick Chubb, D Ernest Johnson. I don't see the utility. I'd rather gamble on Malga's upside. It seems like he's hit it off under a zero Evero's uh, tutelage. And I don't think Baron Browning, I hope anyway, he's not going to be a full-time inside linebacker so he'll or outside linebacker, so he'll play some inside as well. And I've said this before, in Evero's scheme, do they really need more than three inside linebackers? It seemed like it's going to be not so dependent on that position. So they might be able to get by with Jewel, Singleton, and Jonas Griffith, and I'd wave bye-bye. Bye-bye, Justin Sternod. Gave you a nice try, didn't work out. Catch you on the flip-flop, as you would say. Man, I tell you what, dude. Like, he... Uh... By the way, I found out that that whole phrase, dude, is is uh, very dated to the 90s. Like, I've said that to people, and like, catch you on the flip-flop. Well, yeah, you know, the days, they flip-flop. They, you know, they flip-flop over. Catch you on the flip-flop? What? Never heard of that before. Talk to the hand, Chad. But, yeah, that's right. That's, <laughs> that's right. That's a 90s phrase. Uh, anyway, I lost my train of thought. But let's grab Travis. He goes, I was about to ask about Mike Boone. Could he possibly be on the bubble? Seems like he's in a purgatory. I don't think – well, let's look at his contract, Zach. If you want to start talking about him, I'll pull it up. I hope not. I I know it's not much to go on. I don't know much about him before he signed with Denver, but I like what I saw uh, from the very limited opportunity that we saw Mike Boone last year. I would keep him around. You know, I, I know that Melvin Gordon, there's not too much injury concern with him or Javante Williams, but for a third running back who plays special teams, and I don't think his contract is too cap uh, prohibitive. I think it's, what, a million – yeah, I mean, it's so, two, two, two against the cap, but they could save more than it would cost them, but it's negligible. And so I think uh, in the case of Mike Boone, who's still so fresh, you know, in terms of tread being left on those tires, he's got plenty of tread. And uh, I know you brought back Melvin, but I, I really don't think so. Now, if he was a guy making double what he's making now, then you'd he would suddenly be in the Melvin Gordon kind of realm in terms of cap hit. And you don't want that guy not taking any reps on Sunday. I don't know. I think you got to remember Mike Boone got hurt uh, in that Vikings practice right, right before the preseason started. And so he didn't really get put into, I'm trying to remember the designation. They, they had to put him on IR I'm pretty sure. Right. They put him on IR. They couldn't put him on pup because he participated in practice. So, uh, I'm pretty sure he went on IR, missed a good chunk of the season. I'll have to, I'll go to his wiki and try and re refresh my memory on that. But either way, by the time he got back on the field and available and healthy fully, my point is, um, the Broncos had a pretty good thing going with Melvin and Javante. And so he was just the third wheel. I mean, I'd rather have Mike Boone than the $425,000 in cap savings. I think he can be a good player yes. and you can never have... At that position, if you're going to use Javante and Melvin like battering rams, you need one more guy. So I'm keeping three running backs. I'm keeping Javante, Melvin, and uh, Mike Boone. Yeah, so he was placed on IR September 1 and then activated after the eight weeks, September or uh, October 16th. So that's one of the reasons why it felt like he was a failure to launch in year one. Well, really, he wasn't injured that whole time, but their hands were tied. They knew he wouldn't be available to play till I think it was week three or four. And meanwhile, if they carried him on the 53 to open uh, the season, that's a roster spot that is not helping the team for a month. So they decided to risk him not being available to him for an additional month after that because they knew that Javante was, you know, fresh second round pick and they had a starter in Melvin. Like they would be okay in all likelihood. Maybe it blew up in their face a little bit, but at the same time, 
Not really, because the Broncos' rushing attack was the one thing they could hang their hat on offensively last year. I just think like there's a reason George Payton signed him. It was one of Payton's first moves as Broncos GM. I know it was to replace Philip Lindsay, but there's a reason why he targeted him. And I'm assuming it goes beyond the Vikings connections. I again I like what I saw out of Mike Boone. I hope he gets a chance to show what he can do. Scott says two million for a guy with 75 career carries and nine receptions. He says there's tread on the tires because he's not good enough to play. I don't know. He has that one game under his belt that basically got him paid. Uh, with the Broncos, that one game in Minnesota. Uh, yeah, like 150, 175 yards, a couple tutties or something. And maybe he was a pet project of Peyton. Like maybe Peyton like helped discover this kid coming out. I don't know, but Peyton likes him. So Mike Boone, uh, Andrew Baker. Hey dude. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of uh, your weekend and everybody be safe. Um, Memorial day weekend, a lot of travel and a lot of activities. People tend to of course, participate in this weekend. So just stay safe, Andrew, and give our best to the fam. And that's an important message. Remember uh, those who gave the ultimate, you know, sacrifice. Amen. And, uh, it's the, the country is very divided right now, but that's the one thing I think we can all agree on. So it's a good Absolutely. message. Absolutely. Charlie Young, appreciate you, big dog. Good to see you in the chat, my friend. Appreciate that very, very much. Um, one or two more, and then we'll dip. We've got... Um, the Bugmeister in the house. Good to see you. Bugmeister. Dropping, dropping the bomb diggity on us. Go yes. Way back. Well, now we're really getting into the 90s here. Appreciate that generosity, my friend. Really uh, helps out a lot. Trust. And we're glad you caught us live too, my dog. Appreciate the thoughts. Appreciate the support. We shall keep it up. Oh, this reminds me real quick before I forget. So if for those of you following on Twitter you know that we changed some things up on the on-demand side of our podcast platform. So every single day, the podcast, we stream them live. And then afterward, we download the audio, slap an intro, slap an outro, and we upload it to the RSS feed so that the people who like to listen on demand on Apple Pods and Spotify and other platforms uh, can listen in that format. Well, we changed some things on the back end of our uh, podcast hosting provider. And it, of course, uh, as we anticipated, gave us some disruptions to some of the people who listen only on demand on the RSS side. Now, if you're on Apple, uh, that was a very temporary disruption. And by that, I mean like a two hour disruption. But there were a couple other, because our podcast has been on a few different networks over the years from um, locked on to. Um, overtime to blue wire and whatnot we've noticed that there were actual duplicates of our show there's two huddle up podcasts it's our show both of them on apple there's there were two on um spotify and so going back through and trying to like rein all this stuff in and keep it all under one unified umbrella i had to delete one of the spotify shows that was created by one of our previous providers or networks and i'm working with apple to do the same on Apple. So if you were a Spotify listener and you're all of a sudden going, wait a minute, where the huddle up podcast, it's not updating or it disappeared. Search it again and you'll find the right one, both on Spotify and on Apple podcasts. So that's just an FYI. And if you have any questions on that, you're not finding it, shoot us an email or DM reach out on social media. This is a decent question, Chad. I thought we can take before we uh, hop yeah, out yeah. of here for tonight. John Butler uh, says, oh, asked, good to see you, John. Thank you for uh, chiming in with us tonight. What are the chances of the idea of trading any player on a one-year contract? Melvin Gordon is a good example. I mean, I, I don't know. Javante would have to literally blow the coaching staff away for them to trade Melvin Gordon. There's a reason why they brought him back so late in the offseason. George Payton really likes Melvin Gordon, what he brings to that room. I'm thinking, though, they're going to have a three-way competition, so they say, at right tackle. And those three guys, Calvin Anderson, Tom Compton, and Billy Turner, are all on one-year contracts. Maybe the loser of that competition or one of the losers gets traded. I'm, I'm trying to think who else is on a one-year deal they might want to flip, but that's what came to mind. I mean, he was left languishing on the free agent market that long. I can't imagine True. he has that True. much trade value, True. to be frank. But um, Travis, appreciate you, big dog. Yes, pay our respects to those who sacrificed for us. Yes. No doubt about it. Hats off to the veterans um, and the victorious dead. And yes, let's ride, indeed. But Zach, let's uh, 
let's get out of here. Before we do, though, I just want to give everybody a quick update on the uh, Super Chat contest on YouTube. This month, as you know, top five finishers on Super Chat in the month of May. We're going to raffle off. Um, oops, wrong one. We're going to raffle off um, a Broncos jersey of the winner's choosing. Only the top five finishers are in that hat. Here is the current rankings. DWI guys at number one. Uh, the Duchess, Michaela, at number two. Uh, let me click over here. There we go. Um, Michael Ronquillo at number three, throwing down big time on uh, Super Chat this month. It's just phenomenal. And then Pobby Tanner at number uh, – so Michael four, Pobby five, and then Tanner and Sam Bam just outside the top ten. There's your update. Keeping track is Scott on uh, on the YouTube Super Chat. Zach, if you want to do the rundown, I will pull up our shout outs for this evening. I wanted to give a quick shout out to Heath Holmes chiming in. Thank you, Chad and Zach, for keeping the great content coming. Appreciate you, Heath. Can't wait for games to start and hear about the fresh Broncos victories. Yeah, from hey, man, big dog. Keyboard to God's ears. God's lips, God's ears. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, that was the Huddle Up Podcast, guys. Thank you all for tuning in with us. We're back on tomorrow night, same time, same place. Until that time, follow us on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. You can follow the main account on Twitter at Mile High Huddle. You can follow Chad on Twitter at Chad and Jensen. You can follow myself at Kelberman NFL. Follow Scott on Twitter at Scout Kennedy. If you guys want some merch, you guys know what it is, where it is, huddleuppod.com. Look at that glorious website renovated website huddleuppod.com get yourself some merch i actually just ordered as you can it was on the screen right there top left corner the dark gray um mhh yeah it's, it's dope i can't wait to wear it on the podcast but all our merch right there huddleuppod.com check that out if you haven't or if you want to again and facebook.com slash mile huddle pod like that page and follow that page guys if you haven't please go to apple podcast and leave your football priest a five star review for a chance to win some merch each and every month but as you see ticking below you, please do these three things. Subscribe, like, and share this video and every video you see on the MHH channel. It really helps us grow and reach more Broncos fans just like you. That it does. We appreciate your guys' support, even during this kind of boring part of the summer where, hey, it's going to even get more boring. But we're going to keep showing up as we have for the last many, many years. So you keep showing up. We'll keep showing up. Trust on that. Shout out to these great supporters. Here on Facebook, here's how you finish tonight. Travis Weber on top this evening. Appreciate that, Big T. Uh, Gary Leeds Palmer, The Silent One, CP, Ben Wallman, Andrew Baker, and Charlie Young as well. And then a shout-out to these great Super Chat superstars this evening. Sam Bam throwing down twice. Dale Fleming, Chase Wellner, and The Bugmeister. Gang, enjoy the remainder of your Memorial Day weekend. Stay safe, and we'll see you tomorrow night. Take care, and as always, guys. Go Broncos.